Welcome to Second Take, the show that focuses on the issues behind the news. South Africa's platinum endowment is a key part of the modern world's future. Mining Weekly editor Martin Kremer tells us more about platinum group metals' many applications. Welcome, Martin. Thanks very much, Shannon. Now, PGMs have been branded the caring metal by SFA Oxford director Stephen Forrest. Can you tell us about some of the medical applications? Yes, and firstly, you've got to remember that, you know, platinum group metals really consist of six metals. So we, we sort of fixate on platinum, palladium, rhodium, which are generally automotive uh, orientated. Yeah, but we forget about the ruthenium and we forget about the iridium and the osmium. And what uh, uh, they were saying this week at the, um, the fifth international platinum conference organized by the Southern African Institute of Mining and Metallurgy uh, was that, you know, platinum group metals have become an integral part of, of the modern world, modern living. And they're calling them, calling them, well, Stephen Forrest being a marketer saying, you know, that these are the caring metals. Well, not only do the, do does platinum make sure that the people in Tokyo don't cough themselves to death because it keeps all those uh, noxious fumes and all the exhaust car fumes out of the atmosphere. But, you know, they've now got <coughs> little platinum coils that when a person has got an aneurysm, they place those coils in that aneurysm platinum coils so that the person won't have to have surgery mm. and uh, it creates a, a situation where people can leave hospitals earlier. Mm. You know, you've also got the pacemakers. Um, we, we know about pacemakers for the heart. You know, they contain platinum, but a lot of these pacemakers are now being made for the brain. You know, uh, as people get older with Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, the idea is that these pacemakers will prevent that. So there's a lot of effort around making sure that when people get older, they can live longer. And platinum group metals are playing a key role. And then if you come into our lifestyle, you know, um, uh, <coughs> besides um, the, the uh, <coughs> medical applications, there are a lot of lifestyle applications. Mm. Tell us about some of those. You've mentioned organic LEDs, for instance. You know, organic LEDs, we know about LEDs, light emitting diodes. And, uh, you, you know, the, the iridium has played a key role in that. And <coughs> when you think of that iridium part of the platinum group metals, just to create <coughs> a, um, uh, I think it's a 700, 700 ounce crucible, which is about 10 inches uh, in length, or 10 inches uh <coughs> in diameter, you need to mine 700, uh, 200,000 tons of ore. Mm. And I think that you know, these platinum miners who are on strike they need to be given films and, and, and told about the wonderful job they're doing mm. and because they're providing life-saving metals. They're also providing metals that go into this, uh, that create the enabling environment for the light-emitting diode uh, type television sets. And we're seeing these big flat screen television. They provide the, these radiant colors and also in your mobile phones. And now they're talking about the organic LED, which is a step up and it's far crisper and quicker and uses less electricity. And I think it's already being used in, in mobile phones, also going into the big flat screen TVs. If that happens, you know, there'll be a new mar demand for, for iridium. And I must say, you know, I've got a lot of respect for these researchers who continually find new markets for our platinum group metals. We've got this Aladdin's cave of treasure here. We're blessed with it. You know, this is where platinum group metals come from. I mean, you can forget about the other places. The, the percentages are so small. And yet we have South Africans who are playing fast and loose, you know, with this endowment, mm -hmm. which could result in an unreliability of supply. If there's an unreliability of supply, the price can rocket. If the price rockets, the scientists will start looking around and saying, hang on, you know, let's try and see if we can use something else. Mm -hmm. uh, why do we have to be... Um, you know, wedded to this. And that is the big danger. Mm. We must make sure we don't interrupt supply. South Africans must realize that it's so crucial. If you want to get into a world market, you mustn't start rocking the boat because people will look for something else. So although these metals are so wonderful, you know, don't play fast and loose with them mm. as the labor sector is playing now. And, you know, I think that there is an opportunity to 
make all the workers very excited about what they're doing mm. because uh, it's a very noble job, this rock breaking, which they don't seem to, too keen to do unless they've paid a heck of a lot of money. And also making sure that they know that we've got to remain competitive. Otherwise, people will look for alternatives and they can do that. And then we end up with an Aladdin's cave that remains in the ground. Nobody cares about it. Mm. So it's important that... Um, you know, we, we enlighten South Africa on a whole, as a whole. And it's a type of metal where they can actually see what they're producing. Exactly. They can go and buy those TVs. Exactly, and, and the cell phones. And when you buy a car, you know, in those spark plugs is iridium. The, you know, they should be told. They should be really given full exposure on, on, on the, the wonderful job they're doing. Now, you've mentioned the cars. It also seems that the technology for self-drive vehicles is a reality. Now, just look at that. You see, these researchers are always looking for something new, and that's why I find them so valuable. You know, they sit in London, Johnson, Matthey, and you get uh, the German companies uh, dealing with research and development on what new applications. It's normally a new application. Now they're talking about these self-driving vehicles. You know, the, the legislation is already there in parts of America, Florida and Nevada, where people can actually go on the public road with a self-driving car. But if you look at the controls of that car, it requires a lot of platinum group metal. So that's, again, a new market for us. Even before we get to the fuel cell, which we're hoping for, you know, the biggest market is uh, autocatalysis to make sure that, um, you know, the fumes don't go into the airs of these big cities. But what about, you know, actually the new engine being the fuel cell with the platinum catalysis again? These are the sort of things we should really be encouraging. And I'm very disappointed to say that even <coughs> on the autocatalysis front, you know, South Africa doesn't contribute because you'll find that uh, there are various standards of uh, emission control, particularly in Europe and the United States. And Europe has already reached the standard uh, of an exhaust, car exhaust fume control of Euro 6. South Africa is on Euro 3, you know, equivalent. Half. Half. Now, the, every single developing country in the world is moving to Euro 4. South Africa hasn't moved there yet. Why is that? And the reason is that you've got to have a matching petrol quality. And because of the uncertainty that has been put in the way of our oil refiners, where, you know, every now and again we hear, oh, the government is going to build a, an oil refinery in, uh, you know, Mossel Bay, mm. uh, Petro SA is thinking of this. You don't make those sort of announcement. If you do, you do it. Yes. And if you're not going to do it, you say, we're not going to do it. Because the moment the big petrol companies or multinationals think, oh, these guys are going to start producing, they hang back. Mm. And instead of upgrading their oil refineries, they say, no, we'll treat these as cash cows. Let's just get as much as we can out of them. We'll keep uh, upgrading them and maintaining them, but that's about all. So they aren't giving us a fuel which can lift us to these higher emission levels. And we, you know, we're going backwards uh, as um, a benchmark against what happens in the world, which is so regrettable because we're supplying, you know, the platinum which enables this cleaner air, and yet we're not even enforcing it ourselves. We're not using it. I mean, it's really something needs to be done to give policy certainty. Mm. You know, make sure your policy is clear because if it's uncertain, it places a burden on business. And if there's a burden on business, you know, they won't invest. So we need to simplify, clarify, so that there can be quick implementation. So instead of this, you know, multiplicity of laws, cut down and make sure there's clarity and the intention must be good with the law and then the implementation must be good. Mm -hmm. And we've had a situation where, you know, the intention is sometimes good, like with the Section 54 of the um, Mine Works Health and Safety Act, but the implementation is so bad that it actually sabotages your economy, as we've seen it sabotage the platinum industry by just stopping, you know, mining operations for the most trivial of reasons. There might be some sort of problem with one of the sleepers on the rail and you stop the whole mine. Mm. You know, that sleeper could be replaced in 20 minutes mm. and uh, yet you stop the mine for four days. Mm. And, you know, to restart and stop these mines, you're actually adding to the hazard. So instead of adding to the safety, you're creating a hazard and you're sabotaging your own economy. Mm. So that is something we need to consider. Mm. Well, thank you very much, Martin. It's a very exciting time at the moment. That is. Uh, thanks, Shannon.
That's the show for today. Join us again next time for more news and insights into what's happening in the mining world.